Hi, welcome to this uh, e-lecture for the serial communications uh, lecture slides. Okay, so in this uh, lecture, we are going to be going through the serial communications protocol. Okay, to understand how it works. Okay, and how devices communicate through this protocol, and then from there we're going to go straight into the UART module of the uh, Freedom Bots uh, Cortex M0 Plus microcontroller. Okay, and uh, we're going to learn how to use this. Okay, and now uh, this is important uh, because this is basically the uh, key communication uh, protocol that we're going to use for the Bluetooth link. Okay, uh, between the uh, app as well as the uh, microcontroller. Okay. Uh, I will of course be releasing a separate document and a video, okay, a tutorial on how to do that specifically. Okay, so look out for that. Okay, uh, SPI communications and I2C communications are also very popular uh, serial protocols, okay, that you will come across in many uh, embedded devices. Okay, but I will not be going through those uh, in detail uh, for this lecture. Okay, but if you're interested, you can always uh, read up on your own by looking through the data sheet, okay, of the microcontroller. Okay, now the first thing is the motivation. Okay, why do I want to communicate uh, serially? Okay, uh, basically we know that our microcontroller, our CPU is 32 bits. Okay, which means that it can, it has the ability to deal with uh, 32 bits of data at a time. Okay, of course not all our data will be 32 bits. Some can be 8 bits or 16 bits. Okay, so depending on uh, what exactly uh, we're dealing with. Okay, and as we know, okay, a uh, processor uh, is basically embedded within a controller, okay? A controller is basically, okay, if you were to look at it, okay, a microcontroller is just, uh, has the CPU as its core, okay? And besides the CPU as its core, you have all your peripheral subsystems, like your GPIO, okay? Your uh, uh, SPI bus, your I2C bus, okay? Your UART, okay? Your timer and so on. Okay, so all these... Uh, peripheral devices uh, require pins okay in order for you to uh, use these uh, functions and of course since you cannot possibly have a separate pin for each functionality most of them are multiplex okay so we know that all microcontroller pins are actually multiplex with a lot of different functionalities okay and then we have to use okay so that is why if you look back at uh, all our lab activities, there's always the first step of selecting the correct multiplexi, multiplexer option, okay, depending on what uh, functionality we want for a particular pin, okay. So that is uh, one of the main things, okay, that we have to deal with, okay, that we have a limited number of pins that are actually physically available on the microcontroller, okay. And with that, we can imagine that if I want to communicate with other devices, I will also need uh, a lot of pins, okay, if I were to do uh, parallel communication, okay. So, uh, going serial is actually a great way to cut down a lot of uh, actual physical pins that you need to connect to uh, other devices. Okay, so let's look at an example. So, imagine that you have a microcontroller and each, uh, this microcontroller wants to talk to four different devices, okay, one, two, three, and four. And if you see each of these devices, I have a 8-bit data bus, okay, plus I have two control signals, two control signals. So I have a total of 10 bits, okay, 10 bits, okay, to communicate in parallel, okay. So why we say in parallel is because I have, uh, in this situation, I want to transfer 8 bits at a time. And for these 8 bits, I have uh, 8 lines, okay, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I have 8 lines and I also have two control lines here. Okay, so this is what we call parallel communication. So imagine if one of these peripherals wanted 32-bit parallel communication, I need 32-bit data bus, okay, plus another two, that means 34 lines, uh, total, data plus control. So you can imagine that just to establish parallel communication alone, I need so many pins, okay, uh, which is really uh, not a practical option considering that we are always very constrained by the size of the device, uh, size of the microcontroller, okay, uh, making it, making the whole microcontroller very big means that the overall PCB area will also have to be very big, okay? So that has a, a very uh, big spillover effect on many, many parts of our design, okay? So def definitely this is not the way to go, okay? Uh, if you think about it, okay, in terms of uh, parallel buses, okay, imagine that now I move from individual buses to parallel buses. 
of course that is a huge improvement okay huge improvement why because now instead of eight the eight separate lines for each device i have eight lines but these eight lines are now shared as a common data bus across all my devices device one device two device three device four okay and of course i have four lines here uh, for this select pins okay so this is generally what you call your cs lines okay uh, chip select okay so uh, devices as uh, uh, many peripheral devices have this particular pin called a chip select pin or CS pin and what you do is you can uh, put it into an active state so that that device sort of is enabled or, or, okay and once that device is enabled then I can communicate uh, with that device through the bus okay and of course there are also other control signals here okay such as read write okay or, or some other enable signals okay so definitely from what we saw earlier okay which is individual buses for each peripheral you having a combined parallel bus across all devices is of course a good uh, step in the right direction okay but still imagine that is, instead of 8 bits if each peripheral wanted 32 bits then again it's a huge uh, method to deal with okay so the way in which we go about uh, or we have transitioned uh, to solving this uh, issue or challenge is to uh, serialize all our data okay so uh, what does a serial device or what a serial transmission all about so if you look at the left over here i have a 4-bit data okay uh, d3 d2 d1 z0 and what i want to do is okay of course this is just part of the uh, data bus it could go up to 8 bits 16 bit, or 32 bits or whatever and what i want to do is i want to be able to shift this data out one by one okay so if you imagine my data is 1 0 0 1 0 1 1 0 okay so i want to be able to shift the data out one by one at every clock signal here okay so at the first clock the zero goes out the second clock okay the one goes out then again so in each clock okay so these are all the clocks okay in each clock one bit is transmitted out of my microcontroller or if i'm on the receiving side uh, is basically every clock one bit is coming in okay so it, whether i'm in a transmit mode or receive mode is very similar for every clock okay there is a data either transmitted out or received in okay so you can see that right now uh, i have now converted uh, many many bits into just two bits over here correct clock and serial data okay so this is a huge improvement and as you can see this does not scale with the amount of bits I want to transfer, okay? Uh, that means even if I need to transmit 32 bits or 64 bits or 128 bits, doesn't matter. It is still the same two lines, okay? So that is a huge uh, improvement of and motivation for us to go towards the serial mode of communication instead of the uh, parallel mode of communication. Okay, so right now we have moved towards uh, serialization. So you can see that right now, each of these devices okay device 1 device 2 device 3 device 4 each of them have their own chip select pins okay chip select pins at the same time there is a clock okay and now there is data in uh, in this case data out and data in okay so the data out of the controller is connected to the data in of each of the device okay so that is when the microcontroller wants to send data to these peripheral devices or in the other case these peripheral devices want to send data back to the microcontroller okay so that is uh, the other way of dealing with it so this the out okay can send data back or this device okay so depending on which device has been selected through the chip select pins that peripheral device will be able to send data back okay so you can see right now i now only need four plus three seven pins to uh, communicate with all these devices okay three uh, for the actual clock plus data and these four are of course for the chip select okay so definitely a huge huge uh, improvement and here you can see that this mode of communica communication is called full duplex okay why we call it full duplex is because i can send and receive concurrently okay d out and d in can both happen concurrently okay uh, so we call it a full duplex uh, full duplex communication okay uh, you also can uh, simplify it further 
uh, into what we call a half duplex communication. In half duplex communication, there's only a single data bus here. Okay, so the in and out both are using the same pin. Okay, which means I can only do uh, send or receive at any point of time. I can always switch between the both, but at any point of time, I can either do a transmit over data or I can do a receive over data. Okay, so that is called half a duplex communication. Now, let's come to this asynchronous serial communication. The main difference between synchronous and asynchronous is until now, you, you saw that we always have this clock signal coming out. Okay, that is uh, transmitted together with the data. But right now, when we go towards asynchronous communication, there is no clock at all. Okay, so the clock line disappears. So it's only one single line to transmit or one single line to receive. Okay, and as you can see, uh, everything still has to be aligned to some clocking frequency. Okay, and so the clock must be generated locally. Okay, that means the transmit device must have its own clock and the receive device must have its own clock. Okay, so in this situation, what happens is there must be some way for the uh, receiving device to know that data is coming in, correct? And of a transmit data to transmit in a way that the receive data will also be able to interpret that the data is starting. Okay, so that is what we call the start of a data frame. Okay, and in um, our this example here, which basically what is our UART protocol. By default, okay, when we are idle, the line is high. Okay, the line is high. And what the transmitter will do is, when he wants to start, okay, he will pull the line low. So the first bit, the start bit, is always low. And that is indicating, that is a uh, indication to the receiver that this is the start bit, and now, and now I'm going to start my communication. Okay, so you can see once the start bit has been detected, I wait for half a bit plus another one bit time duration and then I start sampling from there. So from the time zero, which is where I detect the start bit, I wait for one and a half cycles before I start sampling the remaining bits. Okay, and of course once I finish, I must have another bit called the stop bit. Okay, to detect, uh, to indicate that I have uh, ended my transmission. Okay, so there's also this thing called a parity bit, okay, which is used to detect uh, errors in our uh, code uh, once we are transmitting. Okay, because uh, there can always be some interference uh, on the transmission line. So uh, the data bits can get uh, messed up or can get flipped. So this parity bit actually helps in uh, detecting, but it's not a very, very uh, good system. It's just very primitive but it still works, okay, for very basic error detection. Okay, so let's look at the data frame. So as you can see just now, basically we have one start bit, okay, which is basically when the line is pulled low, okay. Subsequently, I have a data packet, okay, the data bits, which can be anywhere from 7, 8, or 9 bits, depending on the configuration we set in our controller. And uh, many microcontrollers also have the uh, ability to decide whether I transmit LSB first or MSB first. Okay, that means if I have a data packet 01101011, okay. So this is of course the most significant bit, and this is the least significant bit. Uh, the device, uh, the microcontroller can actually be configured to transmit either MSB first, okay, or LSB first. Okay, so either I go starting from here or starting from here, okay, depending on some configuration, okay, and the parity bit, like I said, is used for error detection, okay, and it is usually optional, okay, so if you want to implement parity checking, you can do it, okay, and uh, finally, after the parity bit, it's the stop bit, okay, usually it's one or two bits, which is also configurable using the microcontroller registers, okay, so the important thing is, since there is no clock, uh, since there is no clock, that is transmitted together with the data, both devices must already have their own clock on an agreed uh, speed. Okay, so the communication speed or the baud rate uh, has to be pre-agreed upon, okay, and both devices must be operating at the same baud rate. Okay, if they operate at different baud rate, then what will happen is the receiver will uh, interpret all the data wrongly, okay, and you will not be able to get the actual data that the transmitter sent out. Okay, uh, 
Uh, of course, this is just a very simplistic, uh, primitive way of uh, looking at uh, serial communication. Okay, there are also a lot of very complicated or sophisticated network protocols. Okay, but we will not be going into all of that. Okay, as long as you understand the basics, from there you can extend to uh, making the protocol even more uh, robust. Okay, for a, a huge network or multiple devices. Okay, for the error detection, I was mentioning basically we use the parity bit. So this parity bit basically you have a single bit which is either even or odd. Okay, or none means you are not going to use any parity. Okay, so if I say even parity, basically means what? That means the number of ones, okay, will be even. Okay, if it's odd parity, the number of ones will be odd. Okay, so let's look at this. 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So how many ones are there? Total of 6 ones. Okay. So if I am having 6 ones and I say I want to use odd parity, for odd parity, the number of ones must be odd. Okay. So 6 is an even number. So the parity bit will be a 1. Okay. So if I were to transmit this data, okay, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and I say I want to use odd parity, Okay, then I need to append a one more one over here. Okay, so that will make it an odd number of ones. If the same data packet I want to transmit and I want to use even parity, then I say 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and I add a 0 over here. Okay, so that is the even parity. Okay, so that is uh, basically how uh, the even odd parity works. Okay, uh, but of course it is not very... Uh, in a sense foolproof okay because it can only uh, detect odd number of errors it does not detect even number of errors okay so what do i mean by that okay so let's come back to this data 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 and i say i'm going to use even parity okay so i transmit with a zero as a parity bit okay so let's say now i transmit this data okay and it goes through the channel but when i receive okay if I receive 0, 1, 1, and let's say this bit, there is an error, okay, it flips to 0. The rest of them are all correct, okay. So over the receive side, I get this data, and what do you observe? If I count the number of 1s, I get 5 1s, okay, which is an odd number, okay, which is an odd number. So since I am operating on even parity, and I get an odd number, then I know that there is something wrong with this data. Okay, but now imagine that two bits have an error. Okay, so this one become a zero and maybe this zero, okay, will become a one. Okay, so let's say now I have one, one, one. Okay, so this bit is still having an error. So the one is here. Then I get zero, one, 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 zero. Okay, so what do I get? Okay, so you can see that I have now uh, two bit errors. Okay. And uh, what is the total number of ones here for? Uh, let me see, uh, so this zero become a one. So one one. This one, oh sorry, this one is supposed to be a zero here, okay? Because the error is carried on. So right now this is a one bit error, okay? Because only this bit has flipped, okay? This one is two bit error, okay? Basically this flip bit has flipped and this bit has also flipped, okay? So what do you see right now? I have six ones which is even okay and since it is even the error check will say that there is no error okay so that is why we say that if there's an even number of errors okay you're unable to detect okay so let me just uh, tell you this again so you can see that this particular bit 0 1 2 3 4 5 this is bit 5 yeah, so uh, this is bit 4 because this is the parity, correct? So starting from zero here. So this is bit four, okay, and this is this is bit seven. Okay. So in the first case, only bit four as an error. Okay, as an error. In the second case, bit seven and bit four have errors. Okay, so bit seven also flip from zero to one. And bit 4 also flip from 1 to 0. Okay, so there are two errors here. Okay, whereas over here you only have one error. Okay, so when you have even number of errors, you are unable to 
detect the error. Okay, so of course there are a lot of uh, stronger error detection methods like the CRC check, okay, and so on. Uh, but we are not going to go into all of that. Okay, uh, parity is just the basic fundamental one that can help you uh, at a very basic level. Okay, now how do we handle asynchronous communication? How do you develop the software structure for it? Okay, so since uh, communication is asynchronous, we really don't know when the code is going to uh, or when the next data is going to come. Okay, so basically what you need to do is you need to firstly make sure that you have already done the necessary configuration. Okay, configuration basically means things like your baud rate, okay, uh, parity, are you using parity? and number of stop bits. Okay, so these are the main uh, configuration things that you need to take note of and this one must be done for both the transmit and the receive. Okay, both of them must already be configured to use the same setting, same baud rate, same parity configuration and same number of stop bits. Okay, Of course, once all of that is done, the transmitter is ready to transmit. Okay, uh, So your receiver is ready to receive. Okay, Now, in order for it to be effective, there's of course two ways. One is polling, okay. The other is interrupt, okay. Polling, as we have seen, uh, as, as we know, basically I'll keep on checking the receiver to see if some data has arrived, okay, and then I process it. In interrupts, of course, it's a lot more efficient because the CPU is freed up, okay, to do other things, and uh, it just process the data when the uh, data arrives. Okay, so let's look at how uh, we can uh, configure this. So we have uh, what we call a main program, okay? And now what we have is two interrupt service routine, one for transmit, one for receive, okay? And uh, what we want to do is, since transmit and, in, uh, and receive are both interrupts, at any point in time, any interrupt can occur, okay? Through the serial bus. And we want to make sure that this data is sort of captured, and the data that we are receiving is captured, and the data that we want to send out is also transmitted, okay? correctly without losing any information okay uh, what uh, the arm cortex m0 plus does is it actually provides only a single interrupt uh, uh, irq handler okay for you to handle all interrupts associated with the device okay so in uh, later on we will look a bit more deeper into this okay the irq handler is just a single handler so you do not have separate handler for transmit or separate handler for receive but in this common handler you must basically be able to know that if uh, basically you need to go and check, okay, uh, did this interrupt occur because of a transmit operation or did it occur because of a receive operation, okay, and I also need to check whether there was any error during this last transmission that triggered this interrupt, okay, so that is basically how you, we are going to write our ISR, okay, or you're going to do it in the lab, okay, and our very common data structure that we will use, okay, uh, is this thing called queues, okay. So what is a queue, okay? So you can think of queue as a array, something like this, okay. And basically what you have is within the queue, you have two pointers, okay. And basically what is called a head and a tail, okay. So you have a head, a head pointer as well as a tail pointer. And what you do is you write to data at the tail end and you read from the head okay uh, so this will ensure that you have two sort of separate pointers pointing to the same uh, memory structure which is this array or the queue and what you do is depending on where you are you will be able to receive and transmit uh, without actually overwriting any data that you have okay and of course uh, one thing to note is you can uh, wrap around the pointer to make it a circular queue. Okay, so a circular queue you can think of it as something like this. Okay, where you have uh, data that is arranged. Okay, in a particular way where head. Okay, is where you read from. Okay, and uh, tail is basically where you write to. Okay. And if the queue is empty, the size is zero. If it's full, it's at the maximum size. Okay, so that is how the queue is. Now let's look at how we can actually code the queue. Okay, so in this case, we are creating a queue size of 32. That means it has 32 elements. Okay, and uh, we have created a structure here. Okay, where the data is itself is in a 32-bit 
uh, array. Okay, so you can see that this data is 32 elements. Okay, so you have 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, and you have a head, tail, and size. Okay, and what you have is you have a TXQ and RXQ. That means you have two separate queues. One is for transmit, okay, and the other is for receive. Okay, so again, for receive, you have another 32-bit array, okay, uh, and what you are having is, is not only creating the array, but you're creating the entire structure, QT, correct? So this entire structure not only has the array, but you also have your own head and tail and size. Now, if you look at this declaration for the init, head and tail and size are initialized to be zero, okay, because... Uh, what we want to do is we're going to start off from uh, point zero. That means when I first create the array or the circular queue, okay, all the elements, okay, from zero, one, all the way to 31, firstly, they're all initialized to zero, okay, and subsequently, your head also points here and your tail also points here, okay, and my size is, of course, initially zero. And these two functions, QMT and QFoo, are basically to help me check if my uh, Q is uh, empty or is full. Now, these are two important functions, NQ and DQ. So what is NQ and DQ? So NQ and DQ is basically to check, okay, whether I need, uh, whether I'm able to add to the Q and whether I'm able to uh, extract data from the Q. So let's come back to our Q over here. So imagine this is my Q and I have element 0, element 1, element 2. So initially my head points here and my tail is also points, pointing here. And originally my size is also 0. Okay. If I call an NQ function, okay, I will first check that the Q is not full. Okay. If it's not full, what do I do? Q tail plus plus that element, okay, which is for uh, this index, sorry, for the data array will be loaded with the data d so what will happen the data that i pass in okay through this function here this d okay will come here okay so whatever is the data that i uh, send will come here and subsequently what will i do i will do my tail plus plus so my tail instead of pointing here will now point to here okay and my size will also increment to become one Correct. So what will happen after the first data comes in, my Q will look like this. Okay. 0, 1, 2, whatever. So this has already has some data. So my head is pointing here and my tail is pointing here. Okay. And my size is now 1. Correct. Okay. If again I call my uh, NQ function, okay, I will again update with the new data. Okay. D1, for example. And then I will increment my tail to point here, and my size will have become 2. Okay, so as you can see, whenever I NQ, I am incrementing my tail. Okay, for DQ, what do I do? For DQ, I take from wherever the head is pointing. So head is still pointing to 0. So when I call the DQ function, this data will be read out. Okay, and my head will point to the next location. Okay, similarly again, if I do another DQ, it will uh, take this data out and it will point to the next location. So the head will increment whenever I DQ. Okay? And as you can see over here, Q tail percentage equals to Q size, Q head percentage Q equals to Q size. What are we doing here? We are basically making sure that it will always be uh, in a situation where it does not overlap okay and overwrite the data that you have okay so take for example okay take for example q size okay so let's assume my q size is equals to 5 okay so i create 5 elements 0 okay 0 1 2 3 4 okay so when i look at q tail okay q tail will always Initially, tail will be pointing to here, okay? When I first NQ, it will become 1, then 2, then 3, and 4, okay? When 
it becomes 4 and I do a tail plus plus, what will happen? The tail value, okay, the Q tail will become 5. Okay, when I'm tail is pointing to the last element, the Q tail will become 5. So Q tail percentage equals to Q size means when it becomes 5, okay, I will become what? 0 again, okay, because 5 percentage 5 is 0, okay. All the while, 0 percentage 5 will be 0, 1 percentage 5 will be 1 and so on. So when I hit 5, I'll go back to 0. So what this percentage equals uh, Q size does is, it basically makes sure that when I reach the end, I will come back to point to the first, okay. So that is why we actually call this a circular buffer. Okay, or circular cube. Okay, because when I reach the last element, I will actually point back over here. Okay, so that is basically what is happening. Okay, and uh, as you can see, uh, the tail, whenever I NQ, I will increment my size. And for the head, whenever I DQ, I will decrement my size. Okay, so that is basically how the um, uh, structure for the NQ and DQ or the code for the NQ and DQ looks like and I will basically use this in uh, NQ and DQ functions for sending and receiving data okay so when I want to send a data okay I can NQ it okay using this function and when I want to receive data I can DQ it okay so that is basically how you can use queues uh, with your uh, UART module Okay, now how can I pass messages? Okay, when I say passing messages, basically what we are saying is, when I have a string of data, okay, how do I uh, look at it in terms of the message fields and relating them to variables? Okay, so of course, if you have multiple bytes of data, okay, if you have multiple bytes of data, okay, you can say that the first byte, okay, so this is byte 0, byte 1, byte 2. So this byte 0 could be the... Uh, device that uh, send the information and for this particular device certain bits will mean certain things and then you have other bytes to hold data or to hold error codes and so on okay so an example is shown here okay where when i receive a byte when i receive multiple bytes of data what i do is i look at the id for example in this situation to know what it relates to okay so the id okay would basically tell me that if let's say the ID has a value of 84 then this data string okay I will interpret it in this particular format okay so this is just to show you an example only uh, in my other video where I look specifically into the example of using the BTO6 module I will explain in more detail how uh, this data passing can be done using just a single byte of data Okay, so uh, I will explain in more detail in the next video. Okay, so this is just to give an idea on how uh, you can actually interpret data. So you can send one uh, byte first to indicate the ID. And based on ID, you are now able to interpret the remaining bytes that are coming in through the buffer. Okay, so let's go uh, specifically into our Freedom Bots microcontroller. So this uh, picture shows you all the... Uh, pins okay uh, for the UART, SPR and ISPSC we are going to be focusing only on the UART pins okay and these UART pins basically uh, what we are specifically looking at is this two okay port E pin 22 and pin 23 these are the two pins we are going to be using for the lab exercise okay on UART okay uh, as always okay as always you need to make sure that you uh, set the corresponding bits okay for the uh, clock gating okay so the UR modules are uh, mapped to these pins okay so you need to make sure the correct ones are enabled okay uh, another thing is you will see in the lab uh, you also need to make sure the port is port uh, uh, module is also clock gated to the correct value because these are all multiplex together so you need to make sure you enable the port and you also enable the UR okay so that is uh, something you will see in the lab Okay, so for the UART communications, okay, we already have seen this. So basically, it follows the same structure. You have a start bit followed by a data packet, okay, followed by the parity bit and then the stop bit. So this is the standard approach, okay. 
and of course if I am not transmitting anything okay the idle line is high okay the idle line is high for the receiver again similar thing okay uh, you will take for the wait for the uh, start bit to be detected that is time zero and then you wait for half a bit first and then from there you count another one bit okay so you can see that we're always sampling in the uh, the time uh, sampling time is always considered to be the middle of the bit okay so that you do not get affected by the rise and and, and fall of the signal okay so that is uh, basically how the receiver works okay and like i said just now the protocol is important we must agree who must agree the transmitter and receiver okay so for serial communications you must make sure the protocol is established and agreed upon by both transmitter and receiver prior to sending and receiving data okay so all these are information that you have to make sure are configured correctly okay for the uh, microcontroller that we are going to use we have two uarts uh, sorry three uarts okay uh, uart 0 uh, is a low power uart okay and can do oversampling uh, with a range of oversampling options but uh, since we always use the controller in debugger mode okay uh, uart 0 is actually used during that time okay so it is not available so you can use either uart 1 or uart 2 okay so in our lab we're going to be using uart 2 okay uh, if you want to switch to uart 1 for your project you are free to do so uh, but the lab code already gives you the full uh, uh, configuration for the uart 2 module okay so this uh, picture sort of shows you the overall uh, block diagram okay so we do not need to worry too much of how everything is interconnected okay but as you can see when data is coming in we have this transmit shift register okay which is basically shifting in data one bit at a time okay and we also have a parity uh, so this is transmitter so the data is shifted out uh, one bit at a time okay uh, based on whatever value is transferred to the shift register okay so there is a tx buffer that you write to and from there you the microcontroller will transfer the data to a shift register which will then shift the data out okay if parity is enabled then the parity bit will be generated for you to send out okay and then of course you have other uh, bits and registers here regarding the configuration of the baud rate okay the interrupt capability and so on okay so we will look at that uh, shortly okay for the receiver again something similar okay so you can see that the uh, receive data is coming in through here okay where you detect the edge okay for the start and subsequently you do the sampling okay and the data gets shifted in and similarly you also have uh, uh, flags and registers associated with okay things like your interrupt okay your um, board rate and so on okay so we will be looking at all these registers in a while okay so one thing that uh, our microcontroller does is it does this thing called oversampling and what it does is uh within that bit frame that you have okay that means if i say that this is my data okay and i already specify that this is the uh baud rate okay that means this is the time duration for each pulse i will not just sample in the middle i will actually sample okay four times okay i'll actually sample four times okay within this time frame okay or not not specifically four times four times up to 32 times okay for uart 0 and 16 times for uart 1 and uart 2 okay so in this uh, picture of course it's only shown that you only do 4 okay but uh, you can actually configure uh, 4 times or up to 32 times for uart 0 and in our case uart 2 we have 16 times okay that means within each uh, bit sample period you are actually sampling 16 times internally okay and that is basically because you want to improve noise immunity okay like i said just now uh, when we are transmitting data from a trans uh, across a channel there is always a, a possibility that data can get corrupted okay and what you want to do is you want to make sure that uh, as much as possible you want to get the correct data so this oversampling actually helps you with that okay the baud rate generator uh, is basically the module that generates the baud rate that both the transmitter and receiver uh, have agreed on okay and basically how you use it is basically you look at your uh, clock okay so in our case 
in this example, for example, uh, you have 24 megahertz clock, so 24 megahertz, okay, divided by the baud rate that you want, okay. In this case, let's say I want 4,800 baud rate, but you must also remember you must put a time 16 for the denominator, okay. This is because you have a 16 times oversampling that happens, okay. So this is the uh, important uh, formula you must remember, okay. We will be re revisiting this in our lab as well, okay. So this is how you decide which value to write into the baud rate generator bits, which is this uh, SBR register. Okay, so now the important thing, when can I transmit and when can I receive, okay? So in order for me to transmit data, okay, I must make sure that the transmit data register is empty. Okay, so the TDRE is the transmit data, okay, register is empty. Okay, so when the transmit data register is empty, then I can send uh, put data to it and then it will start to get shifted out okay uh, when can i receive or when do i know that i have received data is when the rdrf so the rdrf is receive data register flag uh, register full sorry okay so when the receive data register is full that means i have shifted in that eight bits of data okay and now i can read this data okay so in the polling approach, okay, in the polling approach, you can check for these two uh, flags, okay, to know that you can transmit or receive, or we can also use interrupts, okay, which is of course a better option. Okay, so these are some of the registers. The UART control register is there, okay. Uh, this is again, uh, for example, if I want to do some configuration with regards to parity, if I want to transmit 9-bit instead of 8-bit, okay or if I want to do a loop back and so on. Okay, so this is the UART zero control uh, register one. Okay, um, again, you do not need to worry so much. Okay, when we do the lab, you will actually get a good idea on how to configure all the necessary registers. Okay, so though there can be a lot of registers, you don't need to deal with all of them. Okay, it all depends on what kind of mode of operation and what is it you really want to do with the UART module. Okay, uh, this is of course an important register, UART control register 2. Okay, and why is it important? Because it gives you the uh, an interrupt enable bits, okay, which is this tree. Okay, and of course, you also want to enable the module. So these are of course very important steps. Okay, if I want to enable the transmitter and the receiver. Okay, and the status register is of course uh, critical because these are the two flags that I mentioned just now. The transmit data register empty to know that I can actually transmit data or the RDRF to know that the received data has is full. Okay, and of course another important thing is error. Okay, uh, no matter what there is always a possibility that things could have gone wrong. Okay, and there could have been some error detected. So these bits here, okay, uh, give you some information on the error. First one is the overrun. That means I uh, have data in the buffer, but before I could read it out, it already was overwritten. And the uh, NF is a noise flag, okay? Uh, because, uh, like I said, you are doing oversampling, okay? And if doing the oversampling, the device was not able to sort of reconcile whether it's supposed to be a zero or one, then it could have been due to too much of noise, okay? Framing error is basically uh, you did not uh, receive the proper stop bit, okay? So you are expecting a stop bit, but you did not receive it. And the parity error is, of course, if the parity is already configured, but the parity check says that something is wrong. Okay, So this gives you information on whether there is some error that was detected by the module, okay, whenever you are communicating. Okay, uh, this uh, register 2, you are saying register 2, uh, is not so critical for this time being, but again, uh, you can just go through it to see what uh, the registers, uh, the bits are doing. Okay, but in the lab, we will not actually be using this register for any particular uh, application. Okay, so this software gives uh, is, is a snapshot of basically something that you're going to be doing in the lab. Okay, um, I will not go into too much detail. Okay, but uh, I think the comments itself are self-explanatory. So you can see the first one here is to enable the clocking. Okay, as I mentioned just now, you need to enable clock for both the UART module as well as the particular port. Okay, so this port uh, depends on 
which UART you are using. Okay, so the UART is multiplex. Okay, you have to remember the UART pins. Okay, UART pins are marks with the GPIO pins. Okay, so that is why when I do the clock gating, for that particular UART module, the UART must also be powered and the GPIO module must also be powered. Okay, so that is the first two step. Then of course, uh, I select the correct multiplexer uh, configuration, okay, to make sure that I want to use these pins as not normal GPIO, but for UART configuration. Okay, then uh, before anything, I disable the transmit and receive first. Okay, you do not want to, you want to make sure that uh, the transmit or and receive are not accidentally turned on by some other code, okay, while you are still configuring it, okay. Uh, and this is of course for the baud rate genera uh, generation, okay. So this is something that I mentioned just now, okay. So you use the formula where the clock divided by baud rate times 16, okay. And of course, once you do that, you can now go and do the other configuration such as whether you want parity, how many bits you want, how many stop bits you want and so on. Okay, and what I mentioned earlier is very important. Whatever you do for your transmit and your uh, transmitting device, you must also do for the receiving device. Okay, so you have to make sure that uh, how is the data coming in. Okay, and you must make sure that the uh, UART module is also configured to uh, match the transmitter that you're communicating with. Once everything is done, you can do the enabling and then you are good to go. Okay, how do I transmit? Okay, like I said uh, earlier just now, to transmit, you look at the TDRE register. Okay, the TDRE register must be set, okay, uh, to say that the transmit register is empty, then I can actually proceed to put data in. And the RDRF bit tells me that the receive data register is now full. That means I've just received a new packet of data and I can now go and read the data. Okay, so to transmit, I take whatever data that I want and I write to the D register. When I want to receive, I just directly read from the D register. Uh, D is the data register of the UART module. Okay, and this is an example of a code uh, that continuously transmit okay, something on the UART module. Okay, so we will be looking at all of uh, this code, okay, and analyzing how it works in the lab. Okay, um, this is an example of a receiver module. So basically in this case, what you do is you do a receive pull. Okay, so you receive pull. If I come back here, what am I doing? I am waiting for some data to come in. So until then, I am waiting. So this is the polling, correct? Okay, this is the polling. Okay, I am waiting for the flag to be set. Once the flag is set, I will be able to return this data. So when I return this data, then I can use this data, okay, to do or to put on a LCD. Okay, so this is just an example that showing you how I can use the receive function. For the transmit function, you call the transmit pull. So the transmit pull, okay, basically checks and waits for the register to be empty. Then I can put in a new data to the register, okay, the URD register, and then it will get transmitted out. Okay, for the receiver, it's the other way around. I call the receive pull means I keep waiting for the receive flag bit to be set. And once it is set, the data will be read out from the D register and return from the function. Okay, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, polling is a, a good way to start, okay, uh, to understand how it works. Okay, subsequently, we must transition to interrupts, okay, because interrupts really are very useful in this case because you really do not know when data is going to come in, okay, on the UART, uh, on the serial interface. So you really want to use interrupts, okay, to make sure that your processor is freed up to do a lot of other important things okay so this is the uh, configuration okay so you can see uh, the other configuration earlier who we'll still carry on this is, is from the earlier slides okay so from the earlier slide just now okay all the other configuration that we did just now uh, the mark setting the clock gating uh, board rate all of that will, will come inside here okay and then I do this. So these three steps you should be familiar by now. You set the priority, clear pending IRQ, and you enable the IRQ for the UR2 module. This is to enable the transmit uh, interrupt and receive interrupt. Okay, so as long as your either is uh, either flag is set, then you will uh, be generating interrupt. Okay. Then once you do that, 
okay you initialize the queue over here okay now let's look at uh, this irq handler so for the irq handler basically what you can see here is uh, this handler will be triggered okay uh, for both okay transmit and receive okay so transmit receive okay both you will generate this uh, or you will jump to this irq handler okay so what you need to do is you need to know which uh, event occurred okay so if i'm checking for transmit then i check whether the register is empty for me to uh, transmit the next uh, byte if it is received then i check for the receive flag whether it is set okay so you can see all of this is both of these pages are actually part of the irq handler okay so inside the IRQ handler, I must be checking for the transmit flag and then deciding if I need to transmit or I can also be checking for the receive flag to decide if I am going to receive. Okay. And this is the uh, last part, which is the uh, error handling. Okay. So if I detect any error, I would I might want to decide what to do next. How do I handle the error and how do I proceed from there? Okay. So this is basically how the IRQ handler will be written. Okay. So use this as a good guide okay for your lab exercise as well as for your project okay so that is about it for the uh, uart module okay uh, so if you go back uh, through the slides again you can see that the main reason why we want to go towards uh, serialization is okay a microcontroller now can communicate with another device just using a single line so tx rx here and uh, tx go to rx here okay so a single line if it's just a single one-way communication or two lines if it's two-way communication okay and that is all i need to uh, establish a link between two devices and there is no limit on how many bytes of information i going to transmit okay so it is a very very good and effective way of communicating between devices uh, and as I mentioned uh, in the first few slides, you also have uh, SPI bus and I2C bus, which are both very popular, okay, uh, and available in many controllers, okay. So it's good to make sure that you also know these protocols, okay. But for our lab and our mini project, we are going to be focusing on the UART module, okay. Uh, so look out for my next uh, video and uh, next set of handouts where I specifically go into an example of how to. Uh, set up the link with the Bluetooth module and uh, how the Android app will be able to send some commands to the Freedom Bot through the BTO6 module. Okay, so look out for the next video. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh